This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. So what are the oracles of God? No one in today's Christian world really seems to know, and yet the Apostle Paul said that the greatest advantage of being a Jew was being entrusted with the oracles of God. Michael Root explains what the oracles are and why you need to understand them, because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, hey, Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. What are the oracles of God? Well, the one and only Michael Rood explains that tonight. But first, please welcome my co-host, the Chief Operating Officer of Rood Awakening International, Ted Clayton. Great to be here, Scott. Thank you. And everybody, welcome to Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom. You know, Michael has a great teaching tonight about the oracles of God, some very interesting stuff. This is episode two of a new series we're doing called Rightly Dividing the Truth. This is a series that he taped actually a few years ago, and yes. most of our viewers mm -hmm. have probably never even seen it or heard of it. So we yes. thought, you know, this is really timely stuff. We started to look at a few of the episodes and realized that what he's talking about, it was almost like it, was, it really was ahead of its time. Absolutely. Because he's talking about things now that are really relevant right in front of our faces happening in the world. So we decided, you know what? This needs to be re-released and, and basically remastered uh, to show you it in a different light. So we're calling it uh, Rightly Dividing the Truth, and here is what you will see tonight. It says that Moses received the lively King James oracles. These are the living oracles to give it to us. So not only do we have the written oracles that Moses gave to us, that the prophets then call people back to, and that's what repent means, to come back to what? Come back to the Torah, come back inside the fence where you're protected because outside of the fence, you are under a curse. Inside, that is where the abundant life is. Moses received the living oracles to give to us. The prophets called us back to it. Yeshua's words were recorded and he showed us how to live these living oracles. And the question is, what is this, these, this living communication? It's not the graphos, it's not the written word, but the living word. All right, so there we go, Ted. It's a little bit of the Oracles of God, yes. episode two of Rightly Dividing the Truth from Michael Rood. This is an amazing series. You know, I remember when he taped this, and it was, he just kind of went from memory. He didn't really have much of a, you know, teleprompter or thing. Or like script. That. Yeah. Or a script. Yeah. He just kind of went and boom, 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 boom. And he felt, beautiful he stuff. felt very, uh, ladies and gentlemen, he felt very serious about this subject matter. Uh, so much so that we wanted to present it again uh, here right now. And... You know, Scott, one of the things that I that I see out of this is you get something new every time you see these programs like this. And and I know people at home right now are seeing something, you know, drastically different than they've seen before. And I just think it's a wonderful presentation made yep. by Michael Root. I do too. I mean, I, I, I'm part of what uh, the, the team that edits it and we yes. watch it mm -hmm. to uh, basically uh, make sure that everything's good and, and go through and put the Bible verses up on the screen sure. and things like that. Absolutely. And every time I see it too, it's like, wow, that, that's really good, Michael. I know. <laughs> Great well, information. Great and, information. And that's why we thought everybody needs to see this again because how many people have seen it and forgotten about it or just plain old never seen this before. So we, right. we are bringing it out. It's uh, from about 2016. Yeah. Or so, and, and beautiful stuff. Now, and, and Scott, you know, uh, speaking of that, yes. you know, it's time to talk about the calendar. Yes, real speaking quick. of calendars and timelines, it is time for the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar, the calendar with the longest name on the face of the earth. <laughs> it is the first Shabbat of a new month called ER. This is the second biblical month, and by now you may have your calendar in your mailbox. That's box, right. Or the if new not, ones is, are out. Yep, it's coming very soon if you haven't received it already. Uh, it is on the way. It, re it was received by us last week, and we started sending them out. So. Yeah. 
Uh, now, Scott, your way. today is the the 14th day of the counting of the Elmer, yes, I believe. Yes, that's right. That's correct. Scott, you know, last week we were uh, talking about the Elmer, but, you know, we never really defined what does the Elmer, what are we counting when we count the Elmer, really? Well, it's almost like, you know, in today's world, I mean, we don't really... I guess in, in agricultural terms, when you're trading, uh, like trading commodities with wheat and barley and that kind of thing, you talk about a bushel yes. or something like, a bushel or a peck. A peck is a smaller version of a bushel. bushel. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's the same kind of thing in biblical times. Uh, an omer is actually a measure of wheat. Okay. And that okay. is what, when you're looking for the first, remember when we were looking for the barley before right. Passover? Yes, uh, yes. Go, when we go out looking for the Aviv barley. Yes. It's an estimation. We're not looking for ripe barley at that moment. We're looking for barley in the stage that, you know, we look right before, uh, two weeks before Passover. Yes. In anticipation of the first fruits offering. So it's kind of an estimation that where is this going to be in about, you know, two Two weeks weeks. time. Yeah. You know, or uh, yeah, yeah, about two, you know, four weeks time actually, because we're looking at the beginning of the month and Passover is the 14th, and so gotcha. yeah, several gotcha. weeks gotcha. in, let's yes. just say that. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking at several weeks in to see if, okay, is it gonna be ready by then? Because what we need for the first fruits uh, offering is one omer of barley in order to make a loaf yes. to present at the first fruits offering. Gotcha. That's what this is all about. So gotcha. when we're counting the omer, it's basically, a, it's a commemoration of first fruits because first fruits is the first day yes. of the counting right. of the omer, and then we right. count to 50, uh, Yeshua's ascension is actually in the middle of that. Uh, the 40th day yeah. uh, after the resurrection, that's when he rose. That's the 40th day of the counting of the Omer because he was raised on the day of first fruits. So that's where that comes in. And the mm-hmm. 50th day is uh, when Pentecost or mm-hmm. uh, Shavuot, Shavuot is, right? Is, yeah. And that's when the spirit was given. So you see how all these things correlate. And unless we have someone like Michael Rood to put it all in order for us in the and chronological it, gospels. Into the chronological gospels. We're never gonna yeah. know. That's we're right. gonna think, oh, this is three and a half year ministry and ah, he said this kind of thing in the Bible because it's just, he just wanted something to say. No, the things Yeshua said and did in the Bible have specific reasons for specific days. And that's why I'm so thankful for this because it puts everything together and then people can realize that Yeshua really is the living Torah because he basically fulfilled it on the day the thing needed to happen. You know, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't received your Chronological Gospels Bible, you really need to get that. It really puts everything into perspective. Now, if you're older like me, and sometimes your eyesight's a little, you know, a little bad, then get the larger print edition of the Chronological Gospel. They're both available on the uh, Michael Rood store. And mm-hmm. Scott, where can you go to get that Chronological Gospel? You can go to arudeawakening.tv slash large. If you do that, you'll get right to the large print. I, I like this version, uh, you know, just for portability. Yeah. But the larger version is great because number one, like you said, the, the, the type is bigger. And yes. you know, I'm, I'm yes. getting to that point too, where I need type a little bit bigger. But the greatest thing about it is when you open it up, it, it the, the pages are so large and heavy that it will stay down. open. They stay. Yeah, yes. yeah. So you don't have to keep it open like this one. You would have to. So that's a great, great option for people. Scott, we're almost yeah. out of time. Talk to us a little bit about oh, the love gift this okay. month. Finding God's Gold. This is part two of the Kevin Fishish series we're doing on the uh, love gift. Yes. So this is uh, the second and last episode. Amazing stuff. Finding the Ark of the Covenant with modern technology equipment that finds gold. It's amazing. You're gonna, it's gonna blow your mind. So that is for a gift of $50 or more this month to this ministry. And for a gift of $100, you'll get that and this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a garden flag that you're absolutely gonna love to display in your front yard. Now, we don't have the uh, flagpoles that go with it, but you can get those at any box store for a very, very little price. But this is worth its weight in gold. It is uh, the name of God, this is my name forever, uh, citing Exodus 3.15. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to get this flag. Michael's got it in front of your house. You have one in front of your I do. place. I have and one. I don't think I'm going to get a, I don't have a flag in front of my house, but I think I need to get one because that's, that's pretty right. cool. That's that neat. is. And we also have other flags coming your way as well. We had one for Passover. There's yeah. one coming for Shavuot. Yes. There's one yes. coming for every feast, by the way. So that's, that's right. super cool. You need to get one of those poles and interchange these out throughout the year. So, yeah. well, there we go. Thank you very much, Ted. Thank you, Scott. All right. So, up next, Michael Root explains what the oracles of God are and what you need to understand about them. It's the second episode of Rightly Dividing the Truth, but up next, it's the Kiddush with Michael Root. So go and grab your bread and wine. We'll be back in two minutes. In the 1980s, Ron Wyatt claimed to have found the Ark of the Covenant. 
Today, sophisticated gold detection equipment is suggesting his claim is true. So now it's spinning when it's, it's moving left and right, scanning, and it's pointing to the cross hole, which the Ark of Covenant would be below that. Yes. So it's underneath that area right there. So the Ark is below. Finding God's Gold with special guest Kevin Fisher reveals amazing video that connects Golgotha to the Ark of the Covenant. But the only way to watch it is to receive it as our gift. Donate a $50 love gift and we'll send you Finding God's Gold with Kevin Fisher on DVD or Blu-ray. Or for a donation of $100, we'll send you Finding God's Gold plus a one-of-a-kind yard flag featuring the name of Yahovah in Hebrew, scanned directly from the Aleppo Codex. Or as a special offer for a donation of $300, we'll send you Finding God's Gold with Kevin Fisher, the Name of God yard flag, and a silver-plated serving set, perfect for adding some set-apart elegance to make the Sabbath extra special. These gifts are available only in April, and supplies are limited. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Remember, this offer ends April 30th and supplies are limited. Call now to receive your gifts, 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. The night of the Last Supper, Yeshua took our tone, our tone, leavened bread, and he blessed the Most High, and he broke the bread and said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. He took the cup, and he blessed the Most High, and said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood. The following day, the following day, on the 14th of the month of the Aviv, there were two large loaves on the wall of the temple. And when they took the first loaf down, after that, no more bread, no more leavened bread was eaten. Then when they took the second loaf down, that's when all of the leavened bread in the city of Jerusalem and everywhere else was completely expunged. It was burnt in the fire. That was the rehearsal that was done the following day, just before the Passover lambs were sacrificed in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But Yeshua represents in this very thing, in the breaking of the bread that we do, in the Kiddush, in the sanctification, every Shabbat we remember that his body was broken for us. By his stripes we were healed. And in the taking of this cup, as we say this prayer in thanksgiving to Almighty God, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlam, Borei Pri Hagafen. Yeshua said this, is the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Every meal, any time, any Sabbath, any feast, any time that you need to remember his broken body and shed blood, we do this in remembrance of him. Paul, or Shaul, as his Hebrew name is, in his letter to the believers in Rome, asked a rhetorical question. He said, what advantage hath the Jew? And he answers his rhetorical question by saying much in every way, but chiefly, primarily, because unto them were committed the oracles of God. Now, of all the advantages there are of being raised in a culture in which you are taught the Torah, 
when you rise up in the morning, as you sit at the table, as you walk by the way, as you go to bed at night, of being raised in the nation of priests that are to understand and to be his representatives to the entire world, to be his priest to the whole world, to be his chosen people, to reconcile the world which was divided at the Tower of Babel into to bring them back to the knowledge of the true God when they were completely inundated with Babylonian pagan sun god worship, of all the advantages there are, he says that primarily the greatest advantage that they have is because unto them were committed the oracles of God. Now, what are these oracles that are so important that of all the benefits there are to being raised in and part of the nation that is a representative of the Most High God, that this is the greatest, the, the primary, the chief. In Hebrews, in Hebrews, again we read, for at the time that you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and you become need of milk and not strong meat. At the time you ought to be a teacher, you need someone to teach you the foundational, the first principles of the oracles of God. Obviously, there was something missing. They could only handle some milk. And is this not what our experience is? Week after week, year after year, decade after decade, we get the same verses handed to us and we never grow up. We never get any strong meat. We really never learn to understand and read the Bible so we can be set free from religion. Why? It's because because we are in religion, and these are the only things you need to know to promulgate this particular denomination. We learn this from our cemeteries, theological cemeteries, excuse me, seminaries. We go to seminary because we want to learn the Bible. We really have a hunger for God, but then we find out after our training that we've only learned how to promulgate our denomination, and we're given a job description, which is basically raise the dead one hour a week. You got one hour and raise the dead on Sunday morning. That's your job title. Well, that's a, that's a pretty tough one to crack right there. And we're really never taught how to understand the Bible and to teach people how to understand the Bible so that they can live a power-filled, abundant life. The life that Yeshua came to make available to us is non-existent for the most part in the Christian world. Who is walking with the power of the Holy Spirit that we see in the book of the Acts of the Apostles? Where do we see Philip, who's not even an apostle? Where, where do we see Ananias, Agabus? Where, where do we see these people today? Rarely, rarely do we see these in the Christian world because we have religion. This is my Bible. You know, we, 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 got, we got the mantras that we do, but who teaches the Bible out there so that we can live a power-filled, abundant life? At the time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. You ought not to be even opening your mouth until you understand these oracles, but what are these oracles? Because obviously no one knows what these oracles are because all we get is milk. We don't have meat. No one's even explained what these oracles are. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. Peter says, if any man speaks, if any man teaches, if any man ministers, let him speak as of the oracles of God. Let him speak and teach and minister the oracles of God. What are these oracles? And, and what is it that's so important if, if we're even gonna open our mouth, we better have these things down? Well, the word oracles in the Greek is logion. It means communication. Communication. The, actually, the word scriptures means, it is graphos, which is literally writings. That's all it means, it just means writings. And it can be any kind of writings, but within the context, it tells us what kind of writings, because it can be any writings. It can be Paul's letters. It can be, it can be the, the writing of the Almighty in stone at Mount Sinai. But this oracles is logion, it's communication. And we have 
the communication of the Almighty through his prophets, his primary first prophet being Moses, his prophets for all time, and then Moses speaks of the prophet. The prophet we must shema, we must hear and obey. The 18th chapter of Deuteronomy is the messianic prophecy that the Almighty takes us back to Mount Sinai with this very moment and, and says that you at Mount Sinai didn't want to hear me shout down these commandments anymore. You pled with me. Don't let me, don't let me see this fire and this smoke and this mountain on fire in the in the in the earthquake. Moses, if you You'll just go from the mountain. What and and the Almighty speaks to you. You come back and tell us, and we'll do anything. We we promise. But don't have us stand at the base of this fiery mountain with the Almighty shouting down His commands because we are afraid we are going to die. Moses took that message up into the mountain, and the Almighty said, "They've well spoken that which they have spoken." I will not speak to them in this manner again. I will tell you, Moses, and you will deliver my message. You will deliver my communications, and the people are required to obey every single word. But I know, and you're gonna tell them that they're gonna add commandments, they're gonna take away commandments, they're gonna come up with their own religious system, they're gonna forsake me, and I am going to send another prophet in the future a prophet like unto you, Moses, who hears directly from me. He will not speak his own words. He will only speak that which I tell him to speak. And that prophet, the people must shema. They must hear and they must obey. And if they don't, King James says, it will be required of them. Weak translation. The Hebrew is, it will be diligent inquiry will be made and they will be judged according to their compliance with the words of that prophet. Ladies and gentlemen, that prophet is Yeshua. He is the only one who has put the sword down. I came to bring a sword and that sword separates the rules and regulations of men from the commandments of Almighty God. From every religion and every denomination that takes a piece here and a piece there and constructs their own God and constructs their own religion, Yeshua is the one who says, this is what Moses says, do it. This is how to do it. Follow me, I'm showing you how to do it. And you're gonna stand up against against every religion on the planet. They hate me, they're gonna kill me because I'm messing with the religion. If you wanna follow me, grab an execution stake and get in line because they're gonna come after you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're not upsetting the world religion, you're not following Yeshua. It's time to get on board. It's time to do what Yeshua did, not ask what would Jesus do. No, do what he did. That's what he said to do. Follow me. That means put your feet in the footsteps that he left behind, and then he will be in us to energize, and we will do greater works than he did. If we're not doing greater works than Yeshua did, then we are not listening to and obeying the voice of the Spirit, and we're not obeying the communication that was given to us from the beginning that is for eternity. This, Acts, let's go to Acts chapter seven. Acts chapter seven. Acts chapter seven in verse 38 says that Moses received the lively King James oracles, these are the living oracles to give it to us. So not only do we have the written oracles that Moses gave to us, that the prophets then call people back to, and that's what repent means, to come back to what? Come back to the Torah, come back inside the fence where you're protected because outside of the fence you are under a curse. Inside, that is where the abundant life is. Moses received the living oracles to give to us. The prophets called us back to it. Yeshua's words were recorded and he showed us how to live these living oracles. And the question is, what is this these, This living communication? It's not the graphos, it's not the written word, but the living word. And the living oracles are 
the feasts of the Lord. The feast of the Lord, as Shaul elucidates, are prophetic shadow pictures of good things to come. They are literally the mechanism whereby the Almighty tells the end of time from the very beginning. The feast of the Lord were established and he put the stars in their courses and the planets and the motion of the heavenly bodies for times and for seasons, for days and for years. For times, his reckoning of time, for seasons, Moedim. What are the Moedim in the scripture? The feast of the Lord. Leviticus 23, we'll be into that later in our sessions. But these feasts of the Lord are the mechanism whereby the Almighty tells us the end from the beginning. He is the master of the time-space continuum. He is the one who fulfills his prophecies according to the feast of the Lord. And now I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and in verse 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke, of course, we are right here at the end of chapter 24. Verse 51 is Yeshua's ascension into heaven, but this is after the resurrection. This is during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, of course, Yeshua was uh, was crucified at the very hours the Passover lambs were being sacrificed. He was in the grave just before sundown. He was in the grave uh, for three days and three nights. And then when the women came to the grave early the first day of the week, Sunday morning, it says that the grave was empty. It was dark. The grave was empty. He was already gone. Why? Because he was in the grave three days and three nights and raised on the third day, which is biblical reckoning of time. The day begins at sunset. So he's in the grave just before sunset, uh, one night, two nights, three nights, and then then it was, well, that particular year, the crucifixion uh, and Passover, the 14th day of the month of the Aviv was on a Wednesday. He was crucified on Wednesday. He's in the grave all Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, in the grave all day Thursday, all day Friday, and all day the Sabbath, and raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, which is on the Sabbath. That's why when they came the next day, when it was still dark, no, he didn't get up the fourth night. He got up the third day. And it's a simple understanding. See, that's why the written oracles of God were committed to the Jews. And that's why we're going to let we're going to let the Jews interpret the scriptures the Jews have written and at the end of this entire series I'll allow 5 minutes for the Gentiles to interpret all the scriptures they wrote. It won't take that long. They didn't write any. So, here it is. Yeshua was crucified at the time the Passover lambs were sacrificed. And then he was in the grave before sunset, which began the high Sabbath, not the weekly Sabbath, but the high Sabbath that begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, this is on Sunday. This is after the resurrection appearance of uh, of Yeshua to Miriam that morning in which he told Miriam, go tell my disciples that I'm going to send to my father and their father, to my God and their God, and then to meet me in the Galilee. Yeshua is going to present the first fruit offering and then be back with his disciples. Now, that afternoon, it says that two disciples left Jerusalem. They're leaving Jerusalem during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Ladies and gentlemen, this shows you how despondent they are right during the feast. And at this time, Josephus says that there are about a quarter million Passover lambs that are sacrificed for the Passover, which means there are about two and a half million people in Jerusalem for the feast. The very minimum that is uh, that is calculated would be at least 800,000 in Jerusalem for this, and that is the entire population of the greater Jerusalem area today. I lived in Jerusalem for a number of years, now I live up in the Galilee, and in Jerusalem, it's traffic jam. It's a big city, 800,000 people, that's a minimum that would be in Jerusalem during this time. People coming from all over the world, but yet these disciples, hurt and despondent, thinking that everything that they had given up, their businesses, walked away from everything, that everything was lost, and it says, that they're going toward the village of Emmaus. And as they walked along, they were talking about the things that happened. And, And it says in verse 15, while they spoke together, while they communed together, that Yeshua drew near, but they didn't know who it was. 
says their, their eyes were holden. They, they, he disguised himself in a way that they had, had no idea who this stranger was. And as he approached them, he said, you know, what manner of communications that you have? You're, you're walking, you're sad. Why are, what, what is this morbid talk you're having? You guys are so down in the face. What is wrong? And one of them, whose name is Cleopas, said to the stranger, are you some kind of stranger? You have no idea what's been going on in Jerusalem, the things that have come to pass in these days? And the stranger said, what things? As if he didn't know? And as they walked the road to Emmaus, and they began to tell him what had transpired, and he said, and, and tell me, what happened next, okay? Tell me what happened. You came into town on the ninth day of the month of the Aviv, six days before Passover, and, and he told you to get a donkey that no one has ever sat on before and to get ready for the next day? The day, the 10th day, when the Passover lamb was to be selected from the sheepfolds of Bethlehem and brought into the city gates of Jerusalem with hundreds of thousands of people with their palm fronds and, and with their, their cedar boughs and with their talits and cheering as the high priest brings in the Passover lamb. And, and what? He approached from the other side on the back of a donkey that has never been sat on. Why? Because... The scripture says that the Messiah will come into Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of an ass. Uh, a donkey has never been ridden. Why? It's on the Sabbath day. Why a donkey? Why is he riding a beast that's never been sat on before? Because it's a Sabbath day, and this animal has never worked a day in its life, so it doesn't need to rest on the Sabbath day. And then you came in before the high priest got in with the Passover lamb, and just as you got to the gate, he said to get all the disciples together, and all of the disciples, numbering in the thousands, ladies and gentlemen, because all who had been following in the Galilee are now in Jerusalem for the feast, and they all, as Yeshua enters from the the opposite side begin crying out, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And then, just as they're crying out, Hosanna in the highest, and, and, and then all the people, hundreds of thousands, rush to the pathway from the gate all the way up to the Temple Mount, for, falling in line with all the priests that have lined the path, waiting for the high priest to bring in the Passover lamb from the sheepfolds of Bethlehem. And the disciples open up the way and Yeshua rides in and goes between those two columns of priests with hundreds and thousands of people crying out, Hosea in the highest. And the priests shouted at what they shouted at Yeshua and, and, and the stranger saying, what, what, what did he say? He said, they, they told him to tell your disciples to shut up and quit saying this. They have turned the entire city upside down. And he said, what? He said, I will not. I will not. If the rocks have to be given a voice, the rocks will cry it out because this is a day that has been rehearsed from the beginning of time. This is a day that the Passover lamb who was born in the sheepfolds of Bethlehem makes his triumphal entry and if the rocks have to be given a voice, the rocks will cry it out because this is a living oracle of God that David, who is a prophet who saw beforehand the coming of the Messiah, he put in place this rehearsal. He was the one who put this in place and now Yeshua is fulfilling this rehearsal of the Feast of the Lord to the very moment. And as the Passover lamb was supposed to be taken up to the Temple Mount and staked for the next four days for the inspection of the Passover lamb, which at the end of it, the high priest would make the proclamation, I find no fault in him. Yeshua, it says, goes up to the Temple Mount, and day after day, the Herodians, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, religious and civil leaders alike, it says that they're questioning him, trying to find fault, trying to find something wrong. And then, the end of the fourth day, you say, that morning that the pastoral lambs were supposed to be sacrificed, when the high priest was supposed to have concluded the four-day inspection of the most perfect Passover lamb, born the sheepfolds of Bethlehem, that Pilate, four times that morning, utters the words of the high priest, I find no fault in him. As Yeshua keeps questioning them, one thing after another, one thing after another. Then 
they tell him the whole story. And then he said, oh, fools. You boys are so slow. Ought not Messiah to have suffered all of these things you have just enumerated day after day after day after day after day because these were embedded as prophetic shadow pictures in the feast of the Lord. He had to fulfill this and then afterward to enter into his glory. And then he opened up the scriptures from Moses through all the prophets and he showed them the Messiah fulfilling the spring feast of the Lord. Finally, they get out to Emmaus. And it says that they constrained him. They constrained him, which it's an important part of Eastern culture. They ask, spend the night with us. He said, no, no, I can't. I've got to keep moving on. So you never say yes until you've been constrained, asked the third time. And then they came back and said, the day is far spent. What are you going to do? You need a place to say, said, I'll be fine. I, I, I need to get on to the next city. Thank you so much for your hospitality. Appreciate it. And then the third time they came back and said, our families will be disappointed. You know, please stay with us. You know, you know we, we will not forgive ourselves if you do not stay with us. And finally, with the third constraint, he now accepts. And now, as they sit around the table, Feast of Unloved Bread. Yeshua takes the matzah. And just as he had done with his disciples just days before, the last night that he had dinner with his disciples before his crucifixion, before his betrayal, he took the bread, the matzah now, and said, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Elohim Melech HaOlam, Hamosi Lechem, Min Haaretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he said, this represents my body, which was broken for you. He broke the bread and disappeared out of their sight. Ah, they looked at each other and said, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened to us the scriptures? and they took off on a dead run back to Jerusalem. They went back to the doors that they had slammed behind them with the disciples, behind those closed doors because of the fear of the religious leaders. They knew that they were next. They came after Yeshua, they killed him, they're coming after them next. They were afraid. They then come in and begin to tell the story about the stranger and how Yeshua told them and opened to them all the scriptures and that he just fulfilled the spring feast of the Lord, the living oracles that were committed to Israel. And as they began to tell the story, Yeshua appeared in the midst and said, Shalom, Aleichem, peace unto you. Excuse me, boys, this is my story. Let me tell my story. And it says that he opened their understanding. The word understanding in the Greek is sunesis. It is in Greek literature is defined as the point at which two rivers come together. The Monongahela and the Allegheny come together at Pittsburgh to form the mighty Ohio River. At that point, that is sunesis. Everything that we've done, everything we've experienced in life is there someplace in these neuron chains in our brain. They're like small streams, little rivulets. Some of them are little bitty rivers. That, but yet, when he opened their understanding, all of the rivers, everything that they had learned from a youth as being raised in the Torah, when they laid down at night, when they rose up in the morning, as they sat at the table, as they walked by the way, everything that they had memorized their entire life, finally, all of those individual streams came together and they understood. You will understand and there will be nothing you can do about it as we open the scriptures because this sunesis, that understanding will come because Yeshua is still alive and if you desire and you ask for that gift to receive the love of the truth, 
You will be hungering for that truth, but yet Yeshua said, he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness will be filled. The word filled is kortazo in the Greek, which is filled to the point of one's hunger. It doesn't matter how hungry you are for the truth, you will be filled. You will be filled with power. You will live a power-filled, abundant life. It was Moses who said that Israel would be taken out of their land and that in the last days they would be brought back into the land. Both Isaiah and Jeremiah, as well as several other prophets, speak of this very thing as well, that both Israel and Judah would be taken out of the land and then in the last days would return to the land that was promised to Abraham. And in the 16th chapter of Jeremiah, we read about this end time prophecy. In verse 14 it says, therefore, behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Now, this is particularly interesting because it's just in our generation that they finally found the Red Sea crossing site. Um, once the Mount Sinai uh, in Arabia, as the scripture says, the ancient land of Midian was found. And uh, for nine years, uh, American oil field engineers were able to get artifacts, uh, video footage, photographs and, uh, out of Arabia where they were oil field engineers back into the United States and out to the world. Also a Korean physician for the Saudi prince that's in charge of Mecca uh, was able to get to the mountain, so much evidence has come out, but what happened after Mount Sinai was found, exactly where the scripture said, not where Constantine's mommy uh, came up with uh, uh, you know, the, the, the mountain in the Egyptian peninsula, but 
Then they found hundreds of Egyptian chariots strewn for a mile and a half on the bottom of the Red Sea. We've got it on video. Now the Gulf of Aqaba, the crossing site, it's all there. And so we are reminded now in this generation of what a great and glorious thing it was that the Almighty parted the Red Sea and brought us out of the land of Egypt. But yet there's something that's going to transpire in the last days that is going to make the crossing in the Red Sea pale in comparison. It's almost Almost like it, it, it leaves our memory. We'll no longer say, you know, the, the, the God that brought us out of the land of Egypt. No, the one that brought us out of all the lands that we were scattered. That is absolutely incredible. But now it tells us what is going to happen when Israel is brought back into their own land. In the last days, they will acknowledge, and this is it now in verse 19, they acknowledge, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. And so now we're given the time frame. We're talking about this is a period of tribulation, the day of Jacob's trouble, as it is known by the rabbis, or the great tribulation. In the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee. To Israel, when Israel comes back into the land, the Gentiles will come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, and, and that's really weak, it's really cry out in repentance, surely our fathers have inherited lies. They've inherited vanity. They've inherited things wherein there is no profit. Shall a man make gods unto himself that are no gods? And that's exactly what we have done. The whole Gentile world has forsaken the, the, the instructions, the Torah. They did the same thing Israel had did to get Israel thrown out of the land. And now the Gentiles, instead of learning the scriptures and being obedient to it, now they've made a God of their own choosing. They manufactured their own God. They've forgotten the God that made them. They've made their own gods, and it's a god of wood, hay, and stubble. It is a, the prosperity gospel god, a celestial Santa Claus, a, a, a name it and claim it Jesus. Instead of being obedient and living according to his standard and doing what he said, no, we've made up our own religion. We've made up our own cistern. we made up our own god. And we have inherited lies. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the end time prophecy. It's an end time prophecy concerning the Gentiles. That Gentiles will come unto Israel, and this is what I see. The hundreds of thousands, yea, millions of people every year coming to Israel from around the world. For 10 years, I lived in Jerusalem, in the old city for a number of years. Now I live up in the Galilee, but as soon as I go home, I pack up a bag and I head to Jerusalem. I, I can't stay away from it because that's like, that's like the hometown. And when I go there, I get to meet people from all over the world. And who am I meeting? I'm meeting Gentiles who have come to Israel and they're crying out in repentance and say, I've inherited basically pagan sun god worship. I've inherited the worship of pagan gods. And I admit it. And it says in verse 21, therefore, therefore, and whenever you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? It's because that which is preceded, you have to get the context. You stop right where it is. In King James, they, because of syntax in King James, they usually put, they will usually say, behold, I will therefore. Put the therefore at the beginning of the sentence because you need to put it there so you understand you have to go back. Israel's going to enter the land in the last days, the land that they had been thrown out of. In the last days, the Almighty said he is going to bring them back and he's going to do it through very miraculous means and that miraculous means has not all been completed. And when they are brought back into their own land in the last days, the Gentiles will come and repent that they have inherited lies from their forefathers. They have re inherited a religious system that is nothing but a broken cistern that is powerless. That they will look at the book of Acts and they will realize we have never seen people walk with the power of God like these first century Jewish followers of the Jewish Messiah. The living oracles of God were committed to the Jews. 
We are going to go back and we are going to we are going to listen and we're going to hear and we're going to understand that basically every one of the feasts and festivals of the Christian church is Babylonian pagan sun god worship that came from Babylon through Rome and has been dumped in our laps and it says that when we cry out in repentance and that's all you can do when you finally understand that what you inherited are what the Almighty calls abominations, tovah and sheketz in Hebrew, which means utterly disgusting, putrid, sick, and vile. That we have not only broken the commandment, having other gods in his face, and when he makes a commandment, don't even let the name of other gods come out of your mouth, we realize in the English language that every day of the week is named after a different pagan god. Every month of the year is named after a different pagan god except for July, August, which is named after Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus, two men who became gods. And then when we come to September, October, November, December, that harkens back to the Hebrew reckoning of months. September, septum, seventh, October, octo, eighth, November, novus, ninth, deca, December, 10th. But wait, December is the 12th month on the pagan calendar. Why is it called 10? It's because it harkens back to the creator's reckoning of time. And in the course of our studies, I will take you into the biblical reckoning of time so that you can learn how to count to three and count to seven, and you can understand how the feast of the Lord are these prophetic shadow pictures. But the Gentiles, the Gentiles who cry out in repentance, therefore, because the Gentiles cry out repentance, look at verse 21 again, therefore, because they cry out repentance, I will this once cause them, the Gentiles, to understand. I will cause them to know by experience, that's what that word know is, my hand, my power, and my might. And they, the Gentiles, in the last days, when Israel enters back into the land, they shall know that my name is the Lord. Wait just a minute. The Lord is not a name. The Lord is a title given to every British landowner for the last thousand years. The Lord is not his name because in Hebrew, it is yod heh vav Take a look at your text right there. Look at it. That's why you have the King James in front of you. Look at it. It is capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. Whenever you see that word, or capital G, capital O, and capital D, it is always, in the Hebrew, his name. yod Hey vav Hey. yod Hey vav Hey. it's the name of the Lord. It appears 6,728 times at least in the Hebrew text of the Bible, only once in the King James. And it's written as Jehovah which is correct as long as you understand that there is no J sound in Hebrew. As a matter of fact, in the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, 1611, right here in the Torah, 1611, there is no J. There's no letter J in 1611 King James Version of the Bible. It is a letter I, but the letter J was then later added immediately after the letter I because I is a vowel. I, I is a vowel sound. J is a consonant and it is pronounced as Y, Y. There is no J sound in Hebrew, so every time in your English version of the Bible you see the letter J, you pronounce it as a Y and you will have fairly close to the correct pronunciation at that point. See, we say in English now, the vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Sometimes Y, why? Because sometimes Y is used as a vowel, as in jelly, jelly, E, E. Sometimes it's used as a consonant, yellow. But even today, in most of the world, the English-speaking world, uh, such as Yugoslavia is spelled with a J, not a Y, is spelled with a J. In Europe, it's not Jorgensen, it's Jorgensen. It's not Johnson, it's Johansson. It is pronounced correctly 
According to King James 1611, if you pronounce it with the letter Y. So Yehovah does appear once. Now, there's been a lot of traditions on this and a lot of ways of pronouncing it. And I have pronounced yod heh vav -Hey at least a million and six times as Yahweh because this is a tradition that has developed. However, it was the in the second century that Rome forbid the Jews from speaking the name. But yet there were rabbis in the streets of Israel who were declaring and boldly declaring the name until the Roman soldiers got a hold of the rabbi who was pro pronouncing his name as it was written, and they then bound him in a Torah scroll, stuffed wet cotton, and ignited it and burned him to death in the streets. That is in the second century. And that is when the rabbis got together and said, Rome is forbidding us from speaking the name, and they're killing us for it, so we are going to make a law that from this point on, no one is allowed to speak the name. That way, the people are obeying us, as they should, according to the rabbis, the Pharisees, you know, to obey us, and by obeying us, they're not obeying Rome, they're obeying us. That is when it was put in place that the name would not be spoken anymore. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Rome is no longer controlling Israel. They're not controlling the world. The emperor is dead, okay? We have liberty, we have freedom. And even though the vowel pointings for the name was not put in the later text, such as the Aleppo Codex, the uh, the, the, the Book of the Prophets, the Leningrad Codex, it was not put in there. Uh, there was only two vowel pointings. Without it, it's in, unpronounceable. But the rabbi said, we are teaching our students, once every seventh year, we are teaching our students the proper pronunciation of the name. And so when these books were copied, these scrolls were copied and the codexes were copied, the copyist accidentally a few times put all three vowel pointings in. Now with all three vowel pointings, the scholars at Hebrew University and primarily at Nehemia Gordon said now with that third vowel pointing, which he found as part of his job in the uh, editing of the scientific version of the Aleppo Codex, the Ben Asher Codex, which is considered to be the crown jewel in the most important Hebrew text on the planet. So important is that the shrine of the book is that blast fruit vault is really not there to protect the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's there to protect the Aleppo Codex. I've been in the vault. I've seen the Olympic Codex. I, they brought it out from the vault so that I could see it and witness it. Uh, Reggie White, Nehemia Gordon went down there. Heim Goldman, we all have been down there to see it, and we are among the few rare people who have been able to literally put our eyes on the Aleppo Codex being in the vault down there. And in that Aleppo Codex, with all three vowel pointings, then Nehemia Gordon uh, then says, okay, now we know how to pronounce it, because the vowel pointings are not the vowel pointings for Adonai, that's a tradition. No, it would be pronounced Yehovah, Yehovah, Yehovah. And after Nehemiah came out with his book on shattering the conspiracy of silence, and he is actually teaching in Jewish synagogues the pronunciation of the name, and Jews in the synagogue, once they understand the history of it, are then with their mouth, and the rabbi is pronouncing the name, that conspiracy of silence has been broken, and that is why the Almighty said, even the Gentiles will know that my name is Yehovah. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.